All right, we've talked about the Louisiana Purchase and the opening up of new lands west of the Mississippi. And we talked a little bit about how that contributed to the development of the market revolution. And now we started looking at different uh, aspects, different waves, perhaps, if you will, of westward expansion. We started by looking at the uh, Native American Indian tribes from the American South and the Midwest who were forcibly removed to West and the consequences of that. Now we're going to look at, uh, at another group that, well, wasn't perhaps uh, technically forced to move West, but certainly felt as though they were. By the 1820s, the Second Great Awakening was well underway in the United States. A wave of revivalism and renewed interest in religion that uh, led to the, uh, the origins of a lot of new denominations and sects. Now, in the previous decades, Americans had gotten a little more tolerant of at least different expressions of Christianity, uh, including Catholicism, uh, although, let me stress, I said a little, not a whole lot, and that uh, anti-Catholic bias is something that will uh, uh, kind of be fanned up not long after this period. But, generally speaking, a little more open-minded than they had been, but there were limits to just how far off the beaten path of orthodoxy any group would be allowed to go. The, uh, the Second Great Awakening really spread throughout all of the country at that time, but one of, the, uh, one of the areas where it was strongest was the state of New York. In fact, uh, New York, sometimes referred to at the time as the burned over district, uh, in the sense that you know, when you are evangelizing, when you're trying to uh, call people to a, uh, a stronger religious commitment or faith or a, a new religious commitment or faith, you're going out into the field uh, metaphorically, to uh, bring in uh, bring in the uh, the sheaves, as it were. Uh, new York being burned over meant that it was hard to make any new converts there because so many people had responded to the Second Great Awakening, and one of the people who who responded in kind of a different way was uh, this uh, this young man who had been raised in the state of New York. So he was right here as all this was happening. His name was Joseph Smith. And he had from, from an early age uh, felt that he had received visions from God. And in the year 1823, as he would uh, tell many people, he was visited by an angel, an angel named Moroni, who, uh, who came to him and directed him to this, uh, this spot where these golden plates written uh, in uh, an unknown language were buried in the ground and gave him um, a mystical uh, breastplate and seer stones uh, through which you could look and read in English, what was written on those plates, which would become what was known as the Book of Mormon. And um, he began telling his uh, neighbors about this experience, and uh, many of them were interested and excited. By the way, another aspect of uh, uh, this vision was that the American Indians were actually the lost tribes of Israel. And this was not a new idea. People in the 1700s had been claiming that. And this was by 1829, 1830, the, uh, the origins of a new, uh, new version, a new type of Christianity that has a whole different cosmology known as the uh, Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormons, 
and you know they had a, a lot of a uh, lot of ways in which they differed from mainstream Protestantism, in that, like I said, they had this whole different cosmology about uh, uh, Jesus coming to North America after his resurrection and preaching to the people there, and about the lost tribes uh, and their own. A uh, holy book, uh, in addition to the the Bible, which freaked out some of their neighbors, and what really freaked out some of their neighbors is the fact that by about ten years after they were founded, uh, Joseph Smith was uh, was promoting the idea of a return to the Old Testament practice of polygamy, and it's estimated that during that time, twenty to thirty percent of Mormon families were polygamous. Now, I said he attracted some followers, um, up to a thousand in a short time, and they decided, rather than stay in in New York, uh, they decided to head west into the uh, newly uh, opened areas uh, so as to find a place where they could build a town that would be a, a place of their own. So, they headed west to Ohio, but after a short period of time, they were chased out of Ohio. Then they went to um, Missouri, and uh, before too long, they were facing uh, religious uh, persecution, really, uh, and they were chased out of Missouri. In fact, uh, uh, the, uh, the state governor of Missouri ordered ordered them out. Uh, then they went to Illinois, where they were able to get some property to start a new town. Actually, they didn't get the property to start. They they bought a small town, a really small town called Commerce, and changed its name to Nauvoo, which uh, is from a Hebrew word for beautiful town. So. Ultimately, Smith and his followers wound up by the 1840s in Nauvoo, Illinois, and it was their own town. Uh, Smith was the mayor. Uh, they had uh, like an all-Mormon local government, and uh, uh, at least uh, at first, it seemed like they had been able to establish what they had been looking for. Now, they also had their own militia. And Joseph Smith was the head of their militia that became known as the Nauvoo Legion. But there was also kind of a uh, an unofficial group that had started back in uh, 1838 when they'd been chased out of Missouri called the Danites, which was kind of like a, a vigilante group at the time. Uh, also called the Destroying Angels, who made it, uh, made it their business to essentially drive out dissenters because this was starting to happen. People were starting to, uh, members of the church were starting to complain about this or that and in some cases complain loudly and in some cases splinter off from the main group. Uh, the, the Danites officially... Uh, only existed for that short period of time, just for a few years, and were not under the direction officially of the church or church leaders, but they became a part of the uh, the Mormon legend. And later groups of Mormons were also referred to as Danites, including the uh, security forces and later on the, uh, the bodyguards of uh, Mormon leader Brigham Young. All right, well, there they are now in, um, in Illinois after having uh, fought uh, and, and been chased away from uh, Missouri. And there, too, they meet with, uh, they meet with problems. The sur people in the surrounding towns didn't care for them very much, didn't like their practice of polygamy that they were starting to, uh, that, that was well underway by this time. Uh, didn't like their uh, different ways that they diverged from mainstream Christianity. Uh, didn't like the degree of control that they had uh, in this little town they built, which uh, 
by 1844 had about 12 to 15,000 people living in it, which is a pretty good sized town for Illinois at that time, and also wound up being a, a lot of voters in that district, which gave them uh, some degree of statewide political power as well, and people didn't like that. Well, um, things came to a head when one ex-Mormon, uh, who was sort of uh, disgruntled about various things that the church taught or that the church leadership did, started a newspaper in Nauvoo that was very critical of Joseph Smith and Mormon leadership. And they only had time to put out one issue, one edition, before the uh, town council, presided over by Mayor Joseph Smith, declared the newspaper a public nuisance and ordered it to be shut down. And members of the Nauvoo Legion uh, came to the guy's office and uh, destroyed his printing press. Now, People in surrounding towns who already had a dislike for Mormons and a mistrust, distrust of them um, saw this as kind of like a, a, a last straw because this was uh, a violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of the press. And, well, people who were already anti-Mormon and inflamed uh, use this as their sort of casus belli, their cause for war. Um, and uh, large numbers of, of angry and irate people from neighboring towns started to harass the Mormons. Smith himself was, uh, was ordered to go to the county seat uh, of Carthage, uh, where uh, he was to be, uh, to be sanctioned, um, he was ultimately charged because he declared martial law in the town after this stuff started. Uh, turns out mayors can't declare martial law. So among other things, he was accused of treason against the state of Illinois. Uh, so he and his brother were in, in the jail in Carthage uh, when about uh, 200 angry people swarmed the jail. Swarmed the jail and broke in and uh, shot Hiram, uh, Hiram Smith in the face. Uh, Joseph Smith tried to escape by climbing out the uh, second story window, but he wound up being shot several times and, and he died. Now, several different problems here. Number one, what the heck uh, are the Mormons going to do uh, in, in this situation, especially when, this, uh, when the state of Illinois revoked the charter for the town and disincorporated the town and the town government so that it officially no longer existed, even though the buildings were there. And what are they going to do for a leader? Because Joseph Smith, right, he was the guy that uh, started it all. Uh, he had, however, some foresight, especially considering the, uh, the persecution that they had met with and the possibility of his early demise. And so to avoid uh, any messy uh, issues over the transferring of power, he had already laid out who he wanted his successor to be if anything happened to him. And it was his brother Hiram, which uh, didn't, didn't help, right? Because he died at the same time. Well, the, uh, there was a bit of a struggle for who was going to retain the leadership, uh, but after a short time it fell to uh, this guy, Brigham Young, who decided that it was time to move on from Illinois and seek greener pastures, although the pastures they found wouldn't be that green, and headed west in this, in this huge wagon train of 10,000 people. Uh, by the way, there were other people who were claiming the mantle of leadership who didn't get it, but some of them had followers that broke off from the main church and started smaller uh, subdivisions, unofficial uh, uh, Mormon sects. Well, um, Brigham Young led this huge uh, wagon train westward, ultimately to what is now Utah, uh, 
and this was in 1846. And at that time, they were really leaving the country. They were leaving the United States. Utah belonged to Mexico. Now, around the time they were doing this, the United States went to war with Mexico. Uh, so as they were getting their town established in the Great Salt Lake in Utah, uh, war was breaking out around them. Now, they decided to settle in the Great Salt Lake because it was a long way away from uh, other non-native, at least, people. There were lots of Indians in the area. Uh, but it was it was kind of far flung off the beaten path and it was uh, kind of a desert so no one else would want it so they would be safe there they believed uh, and that's where they that's where they settled and as the war started uh, the war between the US and Mexico they even provided a militia regiment uh, all Mormon uh, group that went and fought on the side of the US in the war now, once the war was over, um, Utah, having all, well, they had this, they had 10,000 people just initially, and more Mormons were heading out there. There were tens of thousands of Mormons altogether. They automatically had enough people to apply for uh, statehood, even, which California did, uh, as you will recall, uh, in 1850. So uh, they did apply for statehood, but it was denied them. They did get territorial status, U.S. territorial status. But uh, they weren't able to get statehood, even though they had the people for it, the population, because it wasn't approved by Congress, who were, uh, well, had a majority of very anti-Mormon people. So uh, Brigham Young, at least, is there as the territorial uh, a governor, although uh, uh, he doesn't remain so, and they're there in Utah, and in the 1850s, in 1857, the president at the time of the United States, James Buchanan, who by the way is often uh, cons considered by historians the worst president of all time, um, suspected that, uh, that those Mormons were, were up to something, so uh, he actually sent, uh, sent undercover people to infiltrate the church with the, uh, the hope of stirring up a uh, kind of an insurrection among the Mormons against Mormon leadership to overthrow Brigham Young and install someone else who would uh, be uh, essentially... Uh, on the side of the U.S. government, essentially a tool of the U.S. government. And this was discovered. Um, this was discovered, and then something terrible happened. A wagon train was passing through Utah on their way farther west. A wagon train with 120 people in it, men, women, and children, and some of the Mormons in the region were very suspicious. They, they had become very suspicious. They were a little bit paranoid. You know, they, they thought people were out to get them. And the reason they thought that was people were out to get them. So they were suspecting this whole wagon train was a ruse. And it was uh, all spies uh, sent there perhaps even to, uh, uh, to attack them. So... Uh, with Native American allies, a large group of Mormons kind of fell upon that wagon train and killed everybody in it, all 120 people. This is known as the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and it led to the Utah War, also known as the Mormon Rebellion or the Mormon War. Uh, which there were three Mormon wars. The first one was the Missouri Mormon War, then there was the Illinois uh, Mormon War, and neither of those involved the federal government. This involved the federal government. Federal troops were sent in to suppress this uh, perceived rebellion. Uh, and the troops were led by General Albert uh, Sidney Johnston, uh, who just a few years later, just a couple of years later, would become, I guess three years, uh, would become the commanding general of the Confederate Army. 
uh, for the Confederate States of America that was about to be formed. Um, this, now most people aren't aware that federal troops were called out to suppress the Mormons. Um, it was resolved uh, eventually with, uh, without a whole lot of, of, of bloodshed. In fact, there was probably more bloodshed in these other smaller wars uh, in, in those other states than in this one. But it did not help uh, the uh, perception of Mormons from people around the country. I want to just uh, mention here um, a movie that came out in 1995 called The Avenging Angel about a Danite, uh, played by Tom Berenger. Uh, and in this film, Charlton Heston plays Brigham Young because apparently Charlton Heston had to play every white guy in the 19th century. Um, it was actually pretty good. It's a pretty good movie. It's uh, kind of hard to find, but I recommend it. Anyway, they kept trying to get statehood, and they kept being denied. Finally, in 1890, the Mormon Church um, changed their rules and banned polygamy. Uh, and kind of this was a requirement to apply for statehood. Uh, they had to write a ban on polygamy into their proposed state constitution, which they did. And once they did that, they were allowed to apply for statehood, and they got it within just a few years in the 1890s. Now, throughout that period, Mormons were continuing to travel west to Salt Lake City and to Utah. Utah, by the way, being named for the Ute tribe of Indians who lived there. When Brigham Young was leading his people west on what would become known as the Mormon Trail, actually not when he was doing it, before he did it, he consulted with mountain men who were familiar with the area, which was uh, the same thing that had happened with the first people along the, uh, the Oregon Trail just a few years earlier. So let's talk a little bit about mountain men. Uh, we'll begin by defining our terms Clearly, it's men who are in the mountains, right? But uh, in U.S. history, uh, particularly in the history of the American West, it has a more specific, um, more more specific definition. So, mountain men were trappers, fur trappers, uh, who lived in the uh, the Rocky Mountains during the uh, 19th century from roughly starting around 1810, kind of reaching their peak in the 1840s, and uh, still some of them found uh, working in the mountains uh, by as late as the 1880s. But after 1850, most of the mountain men that you would find were older guys who had been there since they were young. Um, it's estimated that over the... Uh, uh, over that time period, there were about 3,000 active mountain men. So usually you would think not more than a few hundred at a time spread out over a very large area. So the Rocky Mountains, as I mentioned, which you can see here, comprises uh, parts of Colorado, uh, a little chunk of Utah there, uh, parts of Montana and Wyoming and Idaho. In addition to living and working in the mountains, mountain men also were active on the Great Plains, especially the Northern Plains, especially the Upper Missouri area, which we can see here. That's essentially the Dakotas uh, and uh, parts of Montana and Wyoming. And they operated uh, sometimes in companies, uh, sometimes several guys uh, living and working together. but also frequently working individually. So they might be by themselves for long stretches of time until they uh, uh, come together every once in a while in what's called the rendezvous. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, 
I do want to point out, though, that even before John Coulter came into the area, John Coulter being the first mountain man, remember he was the guy who was the scout for Lewis and Clark, there was a French version, French-Canadian version of this, and many of those uh, French, well, French-Canadians, were also active in this region uh, before and during the time of the American mountain men. The uh, French version called Voyageurs or Voyagers or Coureurs de Bois, Runners in the Woods. Often the, uh, the mountain men, whether French or American, would uh, live among Native Americans, sometimes marrying uh, Indian women, uh, sometimes adopting a lot of the, uh, uh, the style of dress and even lifestyle of the Indians. Um, however, there was a, uh, a hunger to be around people of their own culture, which uh, didn't, come, didn't come about that often because, again, a few hundred guys spread out over that huge area we just discussed. So, uh, eventually... They started having a, a big meeting once a year called the Rendezvous that took place in the, uh, the Powder River country of the, uh, uh, the northern plains right there where it meets the Rockies um, in, in uh, Montana, Wyoming area. So they would meet uh, Powder River area and uh, uh, there would be uh, sort of a, a big fair-like atmosphere that usually lasted for several days, and a lot of uh, different uh, representatives from different tribes of, of Indians would would come and participate in this. A lot of the uh, French mountain men, as well as the American, would come together, and they would, uh, you know, they would have contests, they would uh, gamble, they would have horse racing, they would have merriment, song, and dance. In fact, there was a practice there at the uh, rendezvous uh, called the Yellow Apron, or the Yellow Apron Dance, because, well, uh, these guys may have been able to interact with Native Americans and sometimes even uh, have, like I said, Native American wives, uh, but uh, they, they, they often longed for some of the familiar things from back home, like a dance uh, an American style or European style dance where everyone knew the steps, which the Indians did not. So uh, when they would have these dances, the, uh, they had a yellow apron that they would pass around. Kind of like if you've ever played musical chairs, like the last one, Standing Gets Stuck, being it. Uh, similar with the yellow apron. If you get the yellow apron, you have to play the part of the lady in the dance. You have to be the dance partner. And uh, lots of merriment and fun uh, would ensue from that. And this is a representation of that as portrayed in the novel Centennial by James Michener and the uh, miniseries that was, uh, that was based on it. Uh, here are uh, Richard Chamberlain and uh, Robert Conrad as the mountain men Alexander McKeague and Pasquinel. I highly recommend this, especially the mountain men part of it. Centennial, you, you'll enjoy it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I said they were trappers. Uh, they might be trapping various different things, but mainly, mainly they were after beaver. Why beaver? Because beaver, uh, beaver pelts were, uh, were used to make felt for a new type of hat that had started to become popular in the early 1800s, a uh, top hat, <clears throat> which was popular in Europe and then became popular in the eastern United States. So there was a huge demand for uh, the material to make these hats. And that's why the, the beaver trade, uh, the beaver trapping industry really just kind of stepped up. Now, the, the top hat in fashion had replaced the old tricorn hat of the 1700s. So the tricorn hat had been in style for a long time, but it was out of style by 1820. In fact, President James Monroe, 
who served from, uh, well, he was first elected in 1812 and re-elected in 1816, uh, is... Uh, is considered the last America, the last tricorn president, the last American president to wear a tricorn hat. Uh, if you uh, if you look at old pictures from the time, and uh, watch old movies if they're historically accurate, uh, depending on where they're set, you will stop seeing tricorn hats and start seeing top hats. Now, there was a problem by 1850 or so couple of problems. Number one, the beaver population was starting to really, really thin out because they had spent so long trapping them and had trapped so many of them, they were essentially running out. And at around the same time, the popularity of that uh, type of hat started to decline. It didn't go completely out of fashion. You would often see top hats when people were dressed up. Um, but, you know, the, the wealthier they were, the more likely they'd be made of silk. You would see that all the way up until the, uh, the 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt sometimes wore a top hat. But with that decline of both the material to make it and the popularity of the hats, then there was less demand and less ability uh, for someone to make their living as a mountain man. That's why... Uh, 1840s was the peak, and then the numbers of people participating in this lifestyle went down significantly. Also, uh, another reason for the decline is that quote-unquote civilization was catching up to them. Often the uh, trappers and the mountain men were the first white people into a region, uh, and after they had been there for a while, then... Other people come in, settlers, uh, farmers, kind of uh, following the trails that they had opened up, like with the Oregon Trail uh, that I just mentioned. So what they would do, often they used old Native American trails. Um, sometimes they would make new ones. But uh, the people who followed behind them, the settlers, widened those trails out into roads. And uh, once they had done that, it was easier for wagons to come into the West. So if you were one of these mountain men and you were the uh, sort of the stereotypical romanticized mountain man who wanted to be out in the wilderness mostly alone, you were in essence uh, dooming that way of life as you lived it. Because the more you open things up, the more people are going to show up. Well, let's take a look at some of the more notable mountain men from the period. We have to start, of course, with John Coulter, considered the first mountain man. Again, you will recall that Coulter was a scout on the Lewis and Clark expedition from 1804 to 1806, and uh, did not come back with them, but rather stayed in the West and became a fur trapper in the Colorado Rockies. In um, around 1807, 1808, he traveled through the Yellowstone area and saw the geysers there, the, the first non-Indian to, to see those, uh, those geysers. And he believed that he had uh, reached the gates of hell. And when he came back and told people about it, they didn't believe him. And they referred to it jokingly as this fabled place out there somewhere, Coulter's Hell. But uh, a few years later, actually at least a couple of decades later, uh, they discovered, people discovered that uh, it actually existed. Also, it was uh, Coulter who made the famous, well, it's called Coulter's Run. He was captured by Blackfoot Indians and stripped naked and forced to run uh, through two lines of, of Indians, kind of like a square dance, except that they were uh, hitting him with, uh, with clubs and stone axes and stuff like that. And uh, when he reached the end of, that's called running the gauntlet, when he reached the end of that, uh, why then they let you uh, have a nice head start because they're sporting, and then we'll uh, pursue you with, with horses. So he managed to... Uh, Managed to get some distance. He was a pretty fast runner, and one of the uh, one of the Blackfoot Indians who did get close to him, 
uh, Coulter took his spear away and killed him with it. And so he escaped, and there he was, beaten and bloody and naked. Uh, and he had to walk the rest of the way back, uh, back to uh, quote unquote civilization. He did get a blanket from the Indian that he killed. Well, another individual to talk about when you're talking about mountain men is Jedediah Smith, who was known not only as being a very capable fur trapper, but also uh, particularly well known for being an extremely devout Christian. In fact, it is said that he carried a Bible with him everywhere he went, a Bible and a copy of the, uh, uh, the journals of Lewis and Clark. He was often called upon to perform funeral services for mountain men who had died, which means he may well have conducted the first uh, Christian religious services in the, uh, the, the upper Missouri. Missouri. Now, in uh, 1831, the Comanches, no doubt aware of his uh, religious conviction, sent him to heaven. Another, uh, another person to talk about, one of the most famous mountain men, was Jim Bridger. He was, uh, he was involved in the, the fur trade from the uh, 1820s, early 1820s, all the way through the 1840s. Uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, the first non-Indian to, uh, to, to find the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Another uh, of the more famous mountain men, most famous, was this guy, Kit Carson, uh, who also got his start in the early 1820s, like Bridger, as a teenager, and who actually worked with Bridger on some occasions. He, uh, he is the guy that Carson, Nevada, is named after. And like Bridger, he got, uh, got a degree of fame in his lifetime for his exploits and would, uh, would enter the pages of history after the Mountain Man era for his military service during the, uh, during the Civil War out west and afterward uh, in the, uh, um, well, the, the issues with the, uh, the Navajo in particular. Another person uh, to talk about when you're talking about mountain men of the Old West is Hugh Glass, who was, uh, in the early 1820s, part of a company of trappers who had been attacked by Arikara Indians, also called Re, and... Uh, after the attack, as, as the survivors of the attack were trying to make their way back to their fort, um, Glass, who was uh, acting as scout, came across some bear cubs, which was unfortunate for him because their mama was close by, and uh, attacked him and mauled him nearly to death. He managed to kill the bear, uh, but uh, the bear managed to almost kill him. So... Uh, he was uh, broken and bleeding and, and dying and uh, not long for this world. And the rest of the trappers were anxious to get back to the fort because they did want to be long for this world and didn't want the uh, Arikara to, uh, to separate them from it. So two guys were left behind to watch over Hugh Glass until he died and then give him a Christian burial. And the two guys were John Fitzgerald and uh, a younger guy, a teenager, uh, called Bridges or Bridger that may well have been Jim Bridger. So they're supposed to wait for him to die so they can bury him as the Indians are getting closer. And uh, uh, they're getting more nervous because he's not dying. He's, he's hanging on. Uh, so eventually Fitzgerald decides uh, he's going to die anyway. Uh, and we're going to die if we don't get out of here. So let's just bury him now. And so they did. They buried him and uh, went back and rejoined their company. However, Hugh Glass clawed his way up out of the grave after being mauled terribly by this bear. And then he, uh, similarly to John Coulter, made his way on foot back to the, uh, back to the outpost, which was a long ways away. Now, this story appeared on film a few years ago in the movie The Revenant, which means someone who has come back from the dead, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, 
as Hugh Glass. It's a, it's a really good movie, and I highly recommend it. Some of you may have seen it. The biggest difference between this movie and real life is that the movie actually didn't show how bad it was. Um, if you've seen the movie in real life, he was, he was injured more severely and buried more deeply uh, than in the film. I think that they just uh, didn't think anyone would believe it if they showed what really happened. I mean, apparently he had broken ribs protruding from his back uh, when he crawled up out of the grave. Um, and he did. Uh, in, in the movie, they've got him uh, setting out for revenge on Fitzgerald, who had abandoned him, but forgiving teenage Bridger. He did forgive teenage Bridger, and he did uh, set out to find uh, John Fitzgerald, but unlike in the movie, he never found him because Fitzgerald went and joined the army to, to get away from him, basically. Um, another thing about, uh, about Hugh Glass is that the, the movie doesn't say anything about his previous life before he was a mountain man. He was uh, um, captured by French pirates in the Gulf of Mexico a few years before this and impressed into service on a pirate ship. And uh, when the ship got fairly close to Galveston, Texas, at one point he jumped overboard and, and swam to safety and, and escaped and decided, well, you know, to heck with this French pirate business. I'm going to go way up in the mountains where it's safer, I suppose, uh, and make a living. Uh, and we can see how that turned out. Uh, eventually, now this is the sad part of the story, a um, couple of years after his, his incident of surviving the bear attack and the attack by the Arikara Indians, he was part of another group that was attacked and killed by Arikara Indians. Uh, the story was told once before in Hollywood in 1971, a movie called Man in the Wilderness starring Richard Harris. They changed the names around, but basically it's the same story. All right. Uh, another person that I'd like to talk about is this guy who lived to a ripe old age, John Jeremiah Johnson, best known as, by his nickname in his lifetime of Liver Eaton Johnson. They called him Liver Eaton Johnson because he ate people's livers, particularly Crow Indians. Now, what had happened is that uh, Johnson had, uh, well, he had married a, uh, I think it was a, uh, a Salish or, or Flathead uh, woman, uh, and uh, some, some warriors had, had raided uh, while he was away and killed his wife, so he declared war on the Crow Nation. And uh, a, a one-man war that lasted for 25 years, over which, and this might be exaggerated, I don't know, uh, but it's claimed that he killed two or three hundred Crow Indians. Uh, it's pretty, pretty much a full-time job killing Crow Indians for 25 years. And every time he killed one, he would, uh, he would cut out their liver and eat it because the Crow believed you can't get into the afterlife without your liver. So he was adding insult to injury. And finally, after 25 years, the Crow Nation uh, extended uh, some diplomacy to him uh, and, and invited him in and, and had a talk with him and, and made peace with him as though he were another, uh, another nation. Now, he uh, uh, was portrayed in the movies, I think in 1972, by Robert Redford in the movie Jeremiah Johnson. They kind of left out the whole liver-eating thing in the movie. And by the way, it's a really, really good movie. I highly recommend it. Um, so the, the, I guess they thought Robert Redford uh, wouldn't be that appealing if he's going around eating livers. Finally, let's talk about this guy, Jim Beckworth, who was born a slave and was freed by his owner when he was a teenager. Um, the owner may have been his father and made his way up into the Rockies and became a fur trapper and a mountain man. And also... Um, married uh, a crow woman. In fact, he may have had two or three wives. But uh, he was adopted into the Crow Nation and lived uh, with them, uh, not as a visitor, but as part of the tribe for about a decade, in which time he uh, um, served as a crow warrior and gained quite a bit of distinction for his martial exploits. So, 
the uh, the overall uh, arc of uh, this set of stories is that uh, being a mountain man was a tough job, and to be successful at it required uh, quite a uh, quite a degree of, of fortitude and hardiness, and probably a little bit of luck. But uh, it's also important to realize that, particularly when we're talking about the Northern Plains and the Rocky Mountains, it was the uh, fur trappers who kind of opened things up for, uh, for uh, settlement of a non-Native American people. And it's also important, to, to I think, to realize there weren't that many of them. And uh, they made a really, really big impact. So the westward movement of the, uh, the Americans uh, kind of hinged uh, to a large degree on, on these individuals who, most of them, uh, developed uh, really good relationships with some Indian tribes, but maybe not so good with, with others, you know, like uh, uh, Coulter wasn't too fond of the Black, Blackfoot Indians and uh, neither was Jim Bridger. And, uh, well, Liver Eaton Johnson obviously didn't get along with the Crow, uh, but uh, it was a fascinating time period and a fascinating group of people.